You guys have seen the video that Marco and Adrian did on the big guys from Watches and Wonder, i.e. Rolex and Paddock. Well, today we're going to talk about the best of the rest, or perhaps the worst of the rest. But there are certainly other brands out there that took part in Watches and Wonder that we need to discuss in depth. What do you think, Marco? Looking forward to it. Best or worst of the rest? Um, I think there's a lot of good releases. I think a lot of flops. Uh, honestly speaking, I think Patek and Rolex probably were the two best brands in terms of releases this year. But we'll go through some of uh, the Watches and Wonders releases. Let's, let's back up to Audemars Piguet. I know that was released, obviously, prior to Watches and Wonders. But it's certainly worth a mention because I think they did some knockout stuff outside, surprisingly, of the Royal Oak line. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that we had mentioned, we did a video recently on the Holy Trinity, which was probably one of my favorite videos that we ever did together. And uh, that, that video, uh, we both kind of agreed, the Code 1159 line is being used by AP really to appeal to a niche demographic, the independent client, right? The people who will buy the likes of an MBNF or an Urwerk or- You think they're the, scared? Some of the other brands. I think, I think they're certainly intimidated, right? They, it, the, the independent brands have ruffled their feathers enough for them to realize like, listen, this is a market that we need to pay attention to. And so what are they doing, right? They're releasing things like, for example, Super Sunrees. They're releasing, for example, new- Now define for those yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you know, a, a Sunree is a minute repeater, yeah, but what differentiates a regular minute repeater from a Super Sonnery. A, a super sonnery essentially is a is a mini repeater on steroids, right? I mean, it's the best way to describe it. So, in terms of sound quality, but also the the type of sound that you can you can uh, manipulate through it is is different to a regular mini repeater. Now, this watch specifically, skeletonized, is insane. What an insane design! Again, in the Code 1159 case, they're also using ceramic mid cases, so the use of materials is a little bit different. Uh, I sort think of that Royal Oak sandwich, as we like to call it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's in, uh, a little bit different, a little bit ingenious by Audemars Piguet to be using this line. They also came out with the Grand Comp. Now, this now hold on a second. The just, just back up to the Super yeah. Sonnery. Now, is this the same movement? That is this a brand new movement developed? Or did they pick it back off the Super Sonnery they made in the concept case? Yeah, so they did do a Super Sonnery a while back. I think that actually won uh, an award at the GPHG. I think it's the Two same and a movement. half years of research in uh, some Swiss Institute of Sound that's on that they, watch. That's what they all say. <laughs> But hey, <laughs> no, I mean, listen, it's uh, like a long and zone with the Odysseus took them eight years to develop, apparently. Uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, it's uh, it's certainly an impressive feat. I, I'm pretty sure it's the same movement, essentially, probably just uh, slightly redesigned. I would love to, I would love to compare the sounds between the Super Sonnery that they came out with, what now, six years ago, I think five years ago, in yeah. the concept case versus that one. But I don't know the odds of having both of those watches in stock at the same time are probably slim to none. Yeah, they're just too rare, too rare. Um, moving on next, this this one was probably, the to me, the best release that they did in the code case because it's so so damn impressive. So it's not only a grand comm in terms of perpetual calendar, split second, minute repeater, uh, and it's also a grand and petite sonnerie. I think it has like 24 complications altogether. But one thing that they did was uh, create the first ever perpetual calendar where you can go forwards and backwards with the crown. That's never been done before, actually, which is a uh, Renault and Papier invention. Oh, no, not <laughs> Renault and Papier. <laughs> yeah, so, so Renault and Papier invention, uh, actually, the, the mechanics behind this is crazy. And then also they did a version that was skeletonized. Now, again, going back to this idea that they're trying to appeal to that independent crowd, right? If you talk about independence, a lot, the first conversation will be something that I love discussing is finishing, right? The whole concept behind you know, things like uh, englage and interior angles, things like that. And on AP, if you look at, for example, I'm just gonna pull up an image of the open work dial. It's just absolutely insane. You could see all the incredible fine finishing of each bridge in terms of the, the number of so this is So this is AP's, so this is AP's uh, Sky Moon Turbion. Yeah. Right, and uh, again, majority of the time, now this is a minute repeater, a turbion, a perpetual calendar, a split second chronograph, automatic? Uh, I think, yeah, it is. It is and an automatic. So, yeah. and with some innovation to the perpetual calendar. Aesthetically, both the skeleton and the non-skeleton are just- Bonkers. Bonkers, yeah. absolutely bonkers. To be able to fit all that stuff inside that case, lay it out properly to where it's actually very legible, surprisingly, <laughs> right? I mean, the only thing this is missing that uh, Skymoon has is the sky chart. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, mind you, when was the last time Audemars did something like this? If you look, go backwards a little bit and you look at their grand complications, usually that didn't involve a turbion. Yeah. Now, here, with the addition of a turbion, which complicates this even further, uh, I think they absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I don't know if this is their way of 
saying, okay, well, we got all these independents doing this horological stuff and yeah. people are starting to pay attention back to horology versus flex. I think this was a combination of that and also showing people just how big their dick is. I can't think of another company that can put something like that together today. I actually tend to agree with you. So one thing that we discussed, again, going back to that Holy Trinity video is Audemars Piguet is so underrated for their watchmaking today because they have that Royal Oak silhouette, right? It's been done so, so many different complications have been done in a Royal Oak. People tend to neglect just how good of a movement company they are. And so the, the whole Code 1159 is not only creating a, a maybe a certain maturity in terms of the client that AP is going to target uh, in terms of, you know, breadth of collector, not just the Royal Oak collector, but also creating that respect. People are coming back to realize like, holy crap, this is Audemars Piguet. They're not playing around kind of thing. But then the price tag also is not playing around. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's a, it's a one of a kind grand complication. So yeah, you'd have to. <laughs> I think, I think what it is, is, you know, you have independents out there basically, you know, throwing uh, smoke going, hey, I just made a vertical turbine, or, yeah. I, or I just did this, or I just, uh, you know, I managed to hold the power reserve consistently for 10 days, and Audemars Piguet simply says, oh yeah, hold my beer, you know, and then I can't think, I can't think of an independent out there today that can make that watch. No, I don't, I don't think there's really any other than, I mean, short of Grubel Force, but even that would take them. But a even long, Grubel long Force, time. that would take Grubel Force 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. would take a long time for them to develop something like that. And here's the thing is the flex here with Audemars Piguet from a business perspective is saying that, hey, we can actually afford to do this. Yeah. Right? Here we are, we sold a ton of stainless steel Royal Oaks on which we made a ton of money. Right, the company is doing extremely well. Our sales are just fine. We don't need to make a Royal Oak Grand Comp. We're going to make a Code 1159 Grand Comp to show you horology first and foremost, and that's what's front and center in this watch. And that's what I absolutely love about that watch. If somebody asked me today, would I take a offshore Grand Comp versus that, I would go with that. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a better looking watch. From a horological yeah, perspective, I think that's the one release that there's no other release out there that tops it. I actually tend to, I think it might be the best release. The skeletonized version specifically is probably my favorite release. The only other one is that, that kind of smoky skeletonized uh, Minute Repeater Perpetual from Patek. That one is really nice too, um, but I, I think I'd still go- It's AP not smoky. It's, because it's, of the, the it's, innovation. Uh, it's crystal. It's crystal, yeah. crystal dial. But it's like smoked But crystal. that's not a turbion. Yeah. That's, no, it is, I think, actually. No, that one is a... Retrograde Perpetual Turbion Minute Repeater, actually. I don't think so. Maybe not. Uh, Hold on. I have, any, I, have it on my, I have it on my Instagram. Hold in on. In any case, the, what's it called? AP takes the cake for me at Watches and Wonders. St or, sorry, I, overall so far in 2023 with the release of the Grand Comp. It is, it is, you're right, it is a minute repeater turbion. It's just a high data turbion. Next watch. <laughs> so next watch, I actually, okay, so, so hot take. When this first came out, we actually discussed this. I said, ah, I don't really like this. Um, I told you right away, I love this watch. Yeah, you absolutely love this watch. And the more I saw videos of it, maybe it's the renderings, because again, when it comes to the code 1159. Let's start, talk about the fact that we're talking about the new. The what, star wheel. Yeah, the, the, star, new, the new star wheel from Audemars Piguet. The new star wheel. So when it was first released, I was like, ah, I don't love it. The computer renderings didn't show it off properly. Because one thing that I always say to people who hate on the code 1159 is look at these in person. Because there's one thing that's always neglected is the crystal effect, that three dimensionality that the crystal brings. Three is dimensionality, crazy. is that a word? Ian, is that a word? It's a, it's a word. Three dimensionality? Yeah. Must three, be. <laughs> three, three dimensionality, essentially, to the, the star wheel complication. I didn't love the running seconds, actually, but the more that I see it, it's nice to have some life to the dial. It's probably the one thing that I think took away from the old star wheels. And then you have Aventurine kind of backdrop. I actually think the more I, I see this, the more I absolutely love it. I love the history behind the wandering hours, dating all the way back to what, the 16th or 1500, Pope John the Eighth, the Fifth, whatever, whoever he was, and the whole idea going from that uh, to then the inspiration of the wandering hours, then the wandering hours inspiring an entire brand like Erwerk. Yeah. That particular complication is something that AP did first. I think they did it best, and they're still doing it best. I love the older pieces. We just got a platinum one, and yeah, that I platinum love, with, the crazy with, 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 the, with the red dial. It's it's absolutely yeah. insane. I. Love the new one, hot take, that's a watch that I would personally buy for myself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see why not. It's an absolutely beautiful release. And again, I think it speaks to that demographic, right? That independent, that, that high horology kind of demographic. That's something different. Somebody who want quirky, cool, different uh, from, from maybe- it's Certainly a conversation brand. piece yeah. and you know, the story behind the wandering hours. I mean, you did, it was one of the unboxings, I think, where we talked yeah. about the whole history of the wandering hours. What do you got next? 
Uh, the next one, so the last one for modem RPGA, again, this isn't Watchers and Wonders, but it's kind of the, the main line of, of the Code 1159. They updated it now with stamped Gioche dials, which I think are actually much nicer. But the best part is they make these now in stainless steel. So reduces the MSRP dramatically. I think it makes it a more practical watch to wear. Green dial, jump it in a bandwagon a little bit. Yeah, they came out with a variety of colors. Uh, I think there was green, there was like smoked gray. Well, they, they did an automatic, they did a chronograph. Yeah. And again, they did that in stainless steel. Mm -hmm. Dram dramatically, like you said, reducing the, the, the price, making it more accessible. Yeah. And I think this will be a good option. Because look, at the end of the day, and I said this before, um, we talked about it yesterday when, when we were doing a video, where, look, you have to live with the fact that across every brand, across multiple lines, some are gonna be more popular than the others. But there's a smart way to highlight other lines from different perspectives. In the case of the complicated pieces, we'll look at it, it's obviously gonna be the grand comp, it's gonna be hydrological. Then you look at historical, quirky, like the wandering hours. And yep. then there's also the affordability factor, right? Yep. That is still a well-executed autumn RPG chronograph or an automatic. Yeah. It's got a big look, it's got a good look. I've always liked the look of Code 11 for now. When they first came out, going back, what, three years now, I think? It's uh, 2018, and, uh, I think. Uh, oh, five four, years. Year, four years now, yeah. five, almost five. Oh my God, it's been a minute. And people started making fun of them. There were memes everywhere. It's like, oh, this is what took you so many years to come up <laughs> with this, but guess what? I will take that over any of the older Jules lines, the Millinery lines, the Edward Piguet lines. Yep. They're moving with the times, and I think what they've done is they're paying attention to all the right things. Whoever's up there doing all this stuff, they know what they're doing. Lots of people say, oh, I would have done this. Well, you're not, uh, there's a reason why you are where you are and Autumn RPG is where Autumn yeah. RPG is. One thing I absolutely loved also was this, the self-winding model now went from a 4.30 date to a 3 o'clock date. I always say this, whenever you have a 4.30 date, just get rid of the goddamn thing. You know what I mean? Like, it is such an ugly look to the watch, but yeah. That's a personal preference. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Uh, in terms of pricing, I mean, listen, for, for the three-hand model, you're paying 25, 200 euros at the door, right? Which is, again... Is it expensive? Probably, yeah, but it's... But it's in line with their offshore pricing. Exactly, it's, it's in line with, with pretty much every other major brand and their overall pricing for watches. So yeah, I, I think all things considered, having a steel case, very, very smart, uh, very, very smart release for Modem RPG. Let's talk about what you called um, the carnage of the original Gerald Junta design, i.e. the IWC engineer. I posted it on my Instagram. I actually was one of my favorite releases from IWC. It was the release for me because again, go back into history, but I'm not you, you tend to dissect things under a microscope. Yeah. I looked at the watch, I was on vacation at the time, I posted on my Instagram, I said thank you so much for bringing back a classic. And then I started finding out details from you and then I found out how much the watch costs. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's it's probably one of my most disappointing releases because I've been waiting for an IWC Ingenieur 1832 now for probably, I would say, going back even three, four years. I mean, I made Since a video. Since 12. Yeah. Since you were 12? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So, so I, I even made a video um, last year talking about watches I'd like to be re-released, and the 1832 Ingenieur was one of them. They listened. To, I mean, <laughs> not, not really, because the thing is, is the original Gerald Genta design does not have these crown guards, right? And I think even to bring it into the 21st century, I was like, listen, IWC, it's very simple. Like you do the strap change system for your Flieger models, why not have also the strap change system for, for this? Now to me, this release was very disappointing. For one, the price at $12,000 and then $14,000 for titanium. It's not in line with IWC's pricing. Just, when you look at some of their sense. pilot stuff that's sitting there around that $10,000 price range. When you can get a Rolex Yawmaster in titanium at retail for less than an IWC Ingenieur, there's a problem. To me, there's a problem because Rolex carries that kind of premium. IWC does not. So, so to me, this didn't make any sense at all. The pricing doesn't make sense. No integrated strap chain system. It's not faithful to the original design. I think they're releasing this to kind of test the market and say, okay, let's do a re-edition of the original like VC did with the 222. Again, I think that they could have had a knockout home run if they had just released the original. Like, I think this right here but better materials. Is, is just not as nice. Better materials, better movement, yeah. uh, better bracelet. Yep. Uh, again, what you, when you look at you know, taking uh, an old Rolex and compare it to the new Rolex or an old AP compared to the new AP, you know, you take the original 5402, the bracelet is flimsier, the, you know, the dial is not as good a quality, will change color over time, which actually increases the value of the watch. Yeah. So that's not a bad thing, right? The movement obviously is not the same, but look, Make it the same, and I will agree with you there. Make it an exact replica of what it was with an improved movement, yeah. with an improved bracelet change system, if you will. And 
The crown guards don't bother me as much, but I think I, I don't think it's specifically the crown guards for you. It's, it's just the, it's the AMG fact that it, look that a, that that whole Ingenieur AMG look is outdated. What I, I said, like what it. I said on my Instagram is that uh, you know, the reedition of um, the Ingenieur, especially the AMG collaborations and everything else by WC was a big flop. I think the, one of the reasons it was a big flop is because A, they overproduced, they yeah. made too many variations, they made them in some crazy big sizes to keep up with the market. End result, so many produced ended up as a closeout on the market. I remember them trading brand new around 20 to 25 cents on a dollar. If you, I, I was offered a deal in bulk, right? And this case in point, that closeout came out, got spread among you know a hundred different gray market dealers. Prices went down, and you couldn't give away an IWC engineer, which is a shame. Yeah. So here they are, finally revamping the one watch that you know is right up there with the Royal Oak, right up there with all the designs that Gerald yeah. Genta has done, to include the Nautilus. They change it. They made two versions. What I'm hoping not to see is. This was not a limited edition. It's so not. It's a regular. What I'm hoping to see is that that's all they produce for the next two to three years. I don't want to see a chrono version of this. I don't want to see a perpetual yeah. calendar version of this. I don't want to see any versions of Which this. Which you know is but IWC the plane is going to come out. But IWC, yeah. unfortunately, may have to do that. Now, if somebody's asking me out there, is this a buy? Is this something that I want? Look, if you want a piece of history, if you're happy with rendition of this particular model, by all means. Is this something I would wear? Absolutely. But... I just hope and pray that over the next two to three years, we don't start seeing as yep. many iterations of this watch as they did uh, with the last time they tried to do this. I, th I think we're in complete agreement on this one. Uh, next one was another disappointing one. I gotta be honest, people were heaping praise on Vacheron Constantin for the releases. I'm a big fan of the brand. They're my favorite kind of in terms of serial production brand. And to be honest, I was kind of really disappointed by the release Look, they, this year. I was happy. One of the things I mentioned is I was happy to see them bringing in retrograde into the overseas line. So they did yeah. the overseas blue dial with the retrograde moon phase. I absolutely love that. Again, interchangeable straps, bracelet, blah, blah, blah. The best-selling, most beautiful blue dial that's out there. Uh, I was excited about that. What I wasn't excited about is the fact that they just reused an old movement. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, essentially you're repurposing a complication you've done time and again in an overseas case, right? To me, that's not, I, I just, I don't see the vision. You know what I mean? I'm bored by this. I, I look at this and I'm just like, I've seen this before, even in the release of, for example, I think there's the patrimony model with the salmon dial. Like, Same first, watch, salmon dial, yes, slightly bigger, I think. Exactly, with the blue accents. Okay, it looks a little bit nicer, but the, the, first of all, the size is massive. It's a 42 Here millimeter. Comes, here lies the problem. It's like you look at this and you're looking at Vacheron. Yeah. But the minute you look at a Rolex or the minute you look at an AP or something that's uber popular, something that's at the very, very top, and they're doing more or less the same thing, same movement, same complication, change the bezel, uh, change the dial color, add a different complication into the watch, You know, move the date to a different spot. It's, it's, it's really the same thing. The problem is for a brand like Vacheron, or a brand that's not in those top three, top five, the minute they start doing the same thing that seemingly everybody else is doing, it doesn't work as well for them. Yeah. My expectation from uh, Vacheron was, what I would have loved to see is scrap the entire existing overseas line and come up with a brand new one. Yeah. You know, something that's completely uh, yeah. off the wall, red dials, different Green materials. Dials. Like, so, uh, discontinue give the me current give, production. Give me yeah. ceramic, give me yeah. something, right? Yeah. Because the overseas is their Royal Oak, the overseas is their Rolex Samarino, you know what I mean? So with that said, gotta talk about the Turbion. I was impressed by the Turbion. I liked it too. So but before we talk about the Turbion, I think you made a very, very interesting point and I completely agree. It's something that we've discussed before, right? Uh, actually, I discussed it with Avi on, on a podcast where I said, essentially, I want them to discontinue all the current overseas line. Why? Because, first of all, they've been making it now since 2016. So 2016 to 2023, it's a long enough production span. We've seen these models. Discontinue them, cash in on the hype, and go and produce something else. Green dials, red dials, whatever the dial color is. Start with some, Start something the, the way you do it, it's actually a very simple formula. You start off, first of all, we talked about this before as well. Your dress line, slim it down. There's too many, too many. there's too oh many. There's God. way too many variations, way, way too many lines, quote unquote, or models that need to be completely slid down. They've done extremely well with Hysteriques. Yeah. I was hoping to see a Hysterique model this yeah, year. Yeah, the 222 in steel would have been phenomenal. 222 in yeah. steel would have done well in a bigger size. Yeah. Right? Because I think it's still a little bit small in the gold. Uh, give me a Hysterique release. And I literally was expecting that. just that. I was expecting a Hysterique in stainless steel, hopefully a little bit bigger. Yeah. Because that would have been my choice. I would have bought that for myself. And, and slim down the, the dressy line. Yeah. And... The Vacheron overseas could have been a, a, a better approach. Remember the hype that happened surrounding the limited, uh, was it the Mount Everest uh, yeah. uh, overseas? Yeah, yeah. Give me this year, 
with three, four brand new overseas Same type mod- of limit, yes. Limited yeah. editions. Towards the end God. of the year or the following year, release yep. some regular productions and the likes of those, slightly different. Start that line. Oh, let's hit the reset button and overseas. I just don't understand what goes through these executives' head. Like, you see the same watch. Like, these are the same designs. You're uh, recopying Also, when you're part of a group. It just, but it doesn't make sense to me. Like, it just lacks, it lacks any real spirit. I always, you know I, I always just, say, you know, you often hear people say, well, the, 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 the Swiss, they tend to get cocky. And I feel like a lot of, like, that's the vibe that I get when I see these releases. Like, yeah. hey, this is what we're going to do because we're, we're fine. You're not is. happy, it is what it is. Now, does that mean they're actually really cocky? I've met some pretty cocky Swiss uh, uh, people, but at the end of the day, this is how it comes off, not to call yeah. them cocky. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it is what it is. I like the, the retrograde 31 day uh, tourbillon, but by the time that I saw it and I saw the first two releases, I was like, whatever. Like, this is. The 31 uh, retrograde tourbillon yeah. is a beautifully executed watch. I like how they opened up the front of the watch, yeah. uh, showing off some of the complications within the watch. Uh, it's another complicated Vacheron that on the secondary market is going to be gonna selling. Be a flop. It's going to be on the secondary yeah. market, it's not going to do well. Yeah, unfortunately, it is what it is. All right, let's move on to some, I think, some pretty cool releases. I mean, listen, again, in terms of ingenuity, it's not, nothing crazy, but uh, Tudor Black Bay, uh, GMT now with the white dial. I love this look. This, this is, so it goes back to that original albino dial 6542, which is like one of, I think there's like five or eight or something like that, something super insane. Uh, I love this look. I love a Pepsi with a white dial. I think this is just a knockout release. My favorite modern Rolex watch, actually, a meteorite Pepsi. That's my favorite. So uh, this look to me See, is See, I don't like stellar. that. That's why I'm not a big fan of this look. <laughs> for, me, here's, for me, here's the thing. Why have we ever not explored a black and white look? Think about a black or a black and gray look. Yeah, like a tuxedo, tuxedo so style look. So look at this watch. You have yeah. this beautiful, stark white dial. But the minute you look at that dial, then your eyes wander a little bit the bezel just pops like crazy. I'm, I was never a fan of the GMT uh, meteorite dial because I always said it took away from the dial. And for me, in this case, it's the same exact thing. You have this beautiful, beautiful dial. Now imagine that bezel being white and light gray. It's almost subdued. Or to even where all it, black. What about like all black? No, not dial? even all black. It pulls your not even all black because you, the, the predominance of this watch should be the beautiful stark white dial that they produce. Yeah. And, the min- and the same thing goes for the GMT Pepsi meteorite. It's this beautiful meteorite dial. It's, it's like a piece of jewelry that you just want to stare at. And then, the, and then you hit it with a ceramic red and white, I mean, uh, blue and, and red bezel. And I feel like it's, just, it's either too much and it take, one takes away from another. On its own, on its own, put a dark dial on this watch. On its own, that bezel is going to pop. The dark dial is going to disappear. The stark white dial, and the whole purpose of this watch is to show off that beautiful dial, all of a sudden is now being what I feel like ruined by the bezel. Yeah. And that's my take on it. Again, I know you like this watch. I'm not a fan. I yeah. would have loved to have seen that done with, make, give me a white bezel. I mean, the, the only give me, thing- Give me a stainless steel satin bezel. The only knock I'd have on this watch is there's nothing crazy about it. They took the Black Bay GMT and then added a white dial instead of black. But that's right? Rolex. So it's, it's, yeah, exactly. Are you surprised? I mean- Yeah, it's not the same watch. I mean, it's the same watch. Otherwise, I'd love to see like a slim down- What else you got from Tudor? I, I don't like this watch. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Tudor Black Bay 54. That's a new 37 millimeter Black Bay. I like it. I mean, it's not- Again, it's nothing crazy. It's just a 37 millimeter Black Bay 58. Listen, at the end of the day, there's a huge crowd out there that needs a smaller watch. They have smaller wrists. They won't put on anything bigger than that. Like, that's a perfect watch for our buddy Adam Menta. He won't wear a watch over 36 millimeters. You know, for him, that's too big. 40 is too big. 42 is way too big. And he tends to wear watches. Again, he does a lot of vintage stuff. He likes that. 36 millimeter line, right? Yeah. And that would be a perfect watch for him, but it's also a watch that a lady could wear. Yeah, it's a good unisex option for sure. Yeah. I like this release. Again, it's nothing. That's nothing a good looking watch. I can't say. See, see what I mean? Black dial, black bezel. Nothing takes away from anything. Everything works together. Yeah. Now, interesting thing, right? So we discussed on the Rolex releases, um, they didn't do anything for the Submariner because 1953 is technically the official release date of the Submariner for Rolex. Now, the thing is, is this is called the Tudor Black Bay 54. Now, people say that the Submariner actually came out a year later in 1954. So this, like, kind of may confirm it. We'll see, right? We'll see if Rolex releases anything new for the Submariner. I would imagine they would. This year was the year for the Daytona, so. Yeah, we'll see. We'll find out. Maybe it confirms the fact that it was actually released in 54. Uh, This was a nice release by JLC. So it's the new Reverso Tribute Chronograph. 
Uh, and what's cool is the fact that this dial essentially, so, so the first dial essentially just tells time. And then the second dial is actually has all the, the features of the chronograph, right? So 30 minute counter, 60 second counter, and also tells the time, and it's skeletonized. So I think this was actually a really, really nice release from JLC. I think JLC has done extremely, extremely well with uh, their um, tributes, right? Yeah. Every reverse tribute that's come out Green dial, red dial, if you remember those. Yeah, even it's, the tribute moon phases. The, tri the tribute moon the phases, tri they've the done well. The rose gold with the jumping I've always out. said that a Jaeger Reverso is a, an absolute must in any collection because yeah. I think the Jaeger Reverso is one of those top iconic pieces that were ever made going back to 1931, I believe they came yeah. out with, right? Obviously, this is a much more improved version. Shout out to Max Buser for bringing it back to light, obviously. And I would... Love the chrono. I love the fact that they skeletonized the chrono. If I was wearing that watch, I would be wearing with only that dial up. Yeah, 100%. Uh, again, obviously, when they did the reverse duo, uh, I believe it was Max. When Max showed up, he when he was introducing the Jaeger Culture line, he came up with the whole duo concept to spice things up because the original concept is the back of the watch was supposed to be flat metal to, for it to be protected. Yeah. But I don't know a whole lot of guys out there playing polo, let alone playing polo in Jaegers. They modernized the look, essentially, of exactly. the reverso, right? So, they, they brought it to the 21st century. But we got we to gotta mention the gyro. The, the new yeah. gyro reverso that they came out with was an absolute bonkers watch. 360 degree revolution in 16 seconds. Yeah, I mean, you see Grubo Forcey with like, you know, quadruple turbines, you know, running on 24 seconds. Uh, the one, 16 seconds. Yeah, this is 16 seconds, so even more impressive because you have to factor in the friction of components, right? So right. whenever it makes one revolution, you know, there's wear and tear naturally on the parts. And listen, JLC is not going to put out a subpar product. They're not a subpar brand. So to create something that that rev that essentially revolves so quickly, uh, I mean, it's it's. I think I think the reason I bring this up is to go back to what we st started this discussion with when we were talking about Audemars Piguet, and that was Audemars Piguet's way to do what to sort of show the independence that A, we can do better, yeah. to bring back that, bring attention back from that crowd back to Audemars see, Piguet. The, the thing I is think is, the same thing was with Jaeger. Uh, but I think that's where you're wrong because the thing is, is JLC relies way too heavy the same way that AP does on the Royal Oak, JLC does with the Reverso. They do way too much with the Reverso and the other line suffer, like they came out with the Polaris Perpetual, really nice watch, but it's a complete I, li I like a lot of the new Polaris that the, came the out last Polaris year. The new Polaris is the, the first model line I'll say that JLC has a great design with. Everything else, like a lot of these like master compressors and the dress watch line, it's all the same look. It's been the same for like decades now. So this is really the issue. I, I think design wise, like for mechanically, they're, they're beyond reproach, right? JLC is the watchmaker's watchmaker. They've made like 1400 calibers in their history. At this point, they're, they're solidified and stamped in the watch industry. Nobody can take any, anything away from them. But when it comes to their designs, it's the one thing that I think they're really lacking and the reverse of their way too dependent you suggest on. You suggest to uh, same advice to them as for Vacheron, sort of scale down some of yes. their dressy lines, scale Absolutely. down some of their sporty lines and just kind of scale down their lines altogether. Yeah. 100%. I think that's the move. And but that, also, but that I'd new, love to but see that new gyro is still. It's sick. It's, they, they came out, even last insane. year, it's they insane. came out with a World Time Turbion that was right. also beautiful. Um, let's move on to another uh, Richemont brand, Cartier. Uh, Cartier came out with the Can new. Can I just skip this really quickly? Cartier did yeah. a new Santos with a green dial that jumped on a bandwagon. It's going to sell like hotcakes. End of conversation. <laughs> Can we do that? Yeah, let's do that. Thank All you. Right. Then there was also the Santos Dumont, which is actually pretty nice. Uh, I love that Dumont. You're not a fan of that Dumont. I absolutely yeah, love that. Did you see the rotor? It's like that old plane. I mean, whatever. I, that was one of my favorite picks. I absolutely love the look of that. And it's a nice size one watch too so like they released a, my, my biggest disappointment from Cartier is I oh god I hate when they do this they always release these the best watches in like super limited quantity so they did like a small tank on a bracelet in platinum and they released it in like a limited edition of 100 pieces so they're going to sell to the Wacos and Ben Climbers of the world and it's never going to actually hit the consumer markets and it's yeah, we'll, we'll pick it up in a second no, there. don't worry no, yeah but the, the issue is is these brands as, as much as they may have gray watches at the same time nobody can buy them, you know what I mean? Because they all always go to the same 100 clients every single year, year but in, year But their money makers are going to be the stainless steel Santos. Their money makers were going back to the Roadsters, to yeah, the Milan Blues, I get that, and, but you know. They, it's steel same, sports models is what they sell. The same, That's why they were number two. I could say the same thing for Breguet. I can say the same thing with Blancpain for the 40 mil limited edition 50 Fathoms models. All, like there's so many Omega with, although they don't do it as much now with all their limit, their crazy limited editions. They do this so many times where they essentially sell to the same customers and never build up uh, their customer base. But that's all I'll say on that. 
Now you just you just pulled up my pick from Longa, and the pick from Longa is pretty obvious. Obviously, the Odysseus Chrono. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Aesthetically, mechanically, horologically, collectability-wise, bracelet, everything for that watch for me just works. Yeah. The dial is absolutely gorgeous. Obviously, same. Uh, finishes that you expect from Longa, uh, same quality in terms of horologically and the way, the way it works. And again, you get a digital display, day date, and a chrono. It's just red hand. It's just, they knocked it out of the yeah, park. Yeah, it's, it's a knockout release. I think the retail on this is really high, though. It's like 150000 but it's not nothing. Like, I've seen people like say, like, oh, wow, that's insane. But it's a split-second chronograph plus a day-to-day -day complication. Try to make that work. Yeah, it's yeah, not. We it's talked not about this in the last video, yeah. how difficult it is to get that chrono. So in fact, if you missed the last video, we talked about complications and, and yeah. Pretty good depth, and you can realize just how complicated that's to execute, especially when you're talking about a digital day day display. Yeah, so so I think I think this was a knockout release from Longa. It's a, it's a, essentially Longa flexing their muscles to the, the watch world again, uh, creating a self winding split second chronograph like this. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's just it's beautiful. Listen, and aesthetically, I'm, I love the way it looks. See, I'm not the biggest fan. Give me of, give me a rubber band too, by the way. Yes, that's what I, I would prefer. Give me a, give, no, give me two bands, meaning that not on a yeah, rubber yeah, band, yeah. but give me two bands. Give me the bracelet that's interchangeable with a rubber band or a leather strap. Yeah. Give me a Vacheron thing with the three brands. Yeah. And I'm happy. But uh, anybody offers that to me tomorrow at list, I'm buying it. Yeah, it's a beautiful watch, no doubt about it. Okay, let's go on to my favorite segment of the watch industry. Independence. <laughs> yeah. So this is. And he's gonna start with my favorite brand. I gotta be honest. All right, so that Patek Philippe retrograde. Uh, you know what makes me wonder, Ian? As many times as he says, I gotta be honest, I'm wondering the other if times he, when I'm he's actually, when honest. he doesn't say that and when he's not being honest, because he says it so much. All right, so, so I gotta be honest. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. Be honest with me here. So, so the Patek, that, that, I forget the reference, I think it's 5131. It's the 50, it? you're talking about the, the minute repeater? Yeah, that minute repeater, Turbion. I'll tell you the reference, it is 5316. All right, so the 5316 is still my favorite release, but coming in close second, I've said this time and again, my, my current Grail watch, if I have one watch in the world right now, is an MBNF Legacy Machine Perpetual Calendar. And this year they just released one in stainless steel with a salmon dial that I think is just, I think it might be my favorite Legacy Dear Machine Perpetual. Dear Max, <laughs> Marco will give his kidney for the new stainless steel. I think you may get one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be put on the wait list. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, this was a knockout release by MBNF. I think probably one of my favorite Legacy Machine Perpetual calendars ever. I can't what makes you prefer this one over the previous releases? No, I think my favorite is still the yellow gold blue, um, just because I, I'm not even a yellow gold fan, but that contrast, that yellow gold case with That's the blue dial, that. it's just an incredible watch. Um, I have yet to see this. I like stainless steel because it's practical to wear every day. Um, again, you get that, perpet that insane perpetual calendar movement, the flying balance, the, the insane uh, balance bridge that suspends the balance wheel. It's just, it's just a beautiful no watch. No HM release this year. Uh, no. So one no. of the things that, you know, uh, we discussed in the past is that, you know, the LM line sort of taken over the HM line. The legacy machines are doing better than the horological machines because the horological machines seem to be something out of space every single time. Yeah. Something they're that's a little so, too quirky. They're not quirky. There's yeah. they're, they're something out of left field that's yeah. just like, what is that? Yeah. Anytime you look at an HM from... Uh, MBNF, you like what in the actual hell is this, right? Uh, I'm actually, I love the LMs, absolutely, but I'm a big fan of the HMs because of how different they are. And there's no other company out there that does anything even remotely close. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I'll say this. I, I love HMs for their ingenuity, for, for their creative, you know, their creative quality. I was looking forward to an HM. Just what else can they possibly come up with? Yeah, in terms, I mean, listen, Legacy Machine, they're essentially taking all of their existing lines, even. All, they're probably doing Evo models and or they're releasing, you know, the, the regular production models in different variations, right? But listen, this is what the people want. They're giving the people what they want. They've so also, at, the, at the end of the day, they're also a business and used to make money. But it's not even just that. They've been celebrating a lot of, uh, like, like for example, I think uh, the Legacy Machine, uh, the LM2, LM1 came back 10-year uh, anniversary. So they had to, you know, release special editions for those. And, and that's kind of that's kind of the factor in their decision making, in my personal opinion. Because, listen, these are not only popular sellers, but if you're, you're going to have anniversary models, you need to commemorate them in some way. I actually like the stainless steel model. And I like the fact that it's subdued, skeletonized. You don't have a bright dial that's yeah. included as part of the watch because I feel like you're really highlighting the watch or the movement I should say itself you know yeah. the the floating sub dials uh it's a knockout for me the fact that it, this as much as I love like a, the purple dial or uh, the green dial or yeah. the blue dial right 
I feel like that, again, starts to take away from the watch. You really have to look in there. This, to me, if I had to p pick an LM Perpetual, it would be this one, just because I'm looking at the Perpetual yep. rather than a very beautiful dial. Max, if you're watching, please send one in, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, yes. another re-edition by Daniel Roth. Uh, I'll let you start on this one. I so you guys have seen us doing unboxings, and you've seen us uh, saying I've been buying up Daniel Roth. In fact, we just got in a beautiful Skeleton Perpetual, right? Uh, yeah. D Daniel Roth. Uh, and I've been, not quietly, I'm pretty transparent. I've been buying them up and I told you, these guys are sleepers because it's only a matter of time until uh, LVMH says, wait a minute, we bought Bulgari. We did a wonderful job with Bulgari. It took us about, oh, 10 years to finally bring it to light with the introduction of uh, the newer, the newer Octo, Octo line, Octo line yeah. the new Octo line, yeah. right? Originally, you take this, you took the same Gerald Genta design and uh, or latest Gerald Genta design, and you just slapped the name Bulgari on it, remade him, didn't do too well. You did the same thing with Daniel Roth, didn't yeah. do too well, and now, whoa, I think that that purchase happened in 05, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's 04. almost 20 years old. Yeah, that purchase, it's almost 20 years old, and you know you haven't done much of anything, but over the last few years, you finally did something to Bulgari, which I absolutely love. The Finissimo line is. You knocked that out of the park, right? Um, it was only a matter of time I felt like you gotta do, use that same formula and do something for Daniel Roth. Yeah. And what I love that they've done is they reintroduced Daniel Roth as you expect to see Daniel Roth. That Turbion, that triple retrograde, what is that? You yeah, got, you it's, got, it's, it's essentially a, it's the seconds, right? So the, right. those are the seconds and they're told by three different uh, so, so you basically you guys say you have 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds. This is something that Daniel Roth did probably 30 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I actually had that original Turbion here before. Couldn't sell it for the life of me. People just weren't digging it. They didn't understand it. It's not a flex. Well, let me tell you something. That, starting with that, you're going to see a bright future for Daniel Roth going forward, as well as a much brighter future for some of the older models that me and Marka have been hoarding for the last few months. <laughs> yeah, so I'll say this. Uh, in terms of the watch, so it's uh, obviously this is part, if I'm not mistaken, they're owned by the LVMH brand, right? Uh, and so Daniel Roth uh, itself, I, I think LVMH bought the La Fabrique du Temps, and they're making essentially the, the movements for, for this. And I think Kari Vudalainen is doing uh, the dial work, the Guilloche dial work. Now, I'll say this. Daniel Roth, to me, the original Daniel Roth, I'm a huge fan of because they're so different from everything else, right? That double ellipse case shape is, is so unique. Now, this release, I have to be honest with you, right? Because it's an independent brand that I hold in such high regard, I'm a little bit disappointed. I'll explain why. Because they're essentially just re-releasing what's already been done. I actually like that. See, I disagree because in the spirit of an independent, I would want them to do something new. Does that make sense? Like, I don't want to see what I've already seen before. To me, if you're going to ask me, do I want the master's work or do I want LVMH's work? I'm going to go for the master's work, right? I think it makes old Daniel Ross even that much more collectible because their next releases are going to be like the spring case perpetuals, things like that. At least that's what they're rumored to be releasing next. So they're just essentially re-releasing. Spring case are a pain in the ass. If you don't know how to properly open one of those cases, oh you can yeah. be there for an hour. It's actually very simple, yeah. but you really have to know how to open them. If yeah. you don't, we had a client on the phone on FaceTime that could not get one open for the life of him. Yeah. And I don't know if it was a perpetual, but it was a spring case from them. Oh my God, it was a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, and, so, so that's the, and I couldn't explain it to the guy because I need to watch in my hand. Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, but yeah, to... to Listen, I think the watch is a beautiful watch. It's, it's definitely an upgrade, I think, to maybe the older ones in terms of like visual looks to it. However, again, in the spirit of an independent, I wanted to see them do something. Well, how would, you do, how would you do this differently? I don't know. That's the thing. <laughs> like, I, listen, I'm not that. <laughs> maybe it's because I'm old and you're young and, yeah. I, and I absolutely love this release. I love re editions. Like, I think it's a, it's a very faithful, beautiful re edition to an original Daniel the, Roth. How, just, they, how they did it in yellow with yeah. the yellow dial, and uh, gold dial, I should say. I think everything works. That watch did not exist in that color combination. No, it did not. Uh, it was, uh, so, for me, I'm, I'm honestly, I think they knocked it out of the park. I don't, it's it's be, a beautiful looking but, watch. But, but it goes back to what you just said. I mean, yeah. Daniel, why did you like Daniel Roth? Because Daniel Roth is so different, yeah. and like, unlike any other watch. Unmistakably, you see that on somebody's wrist, you know that's a Daniel Roth. Yeah. So what can they do to keep in line with that? I don't that? know, that's, that's the question, right? So that, that's kind of the thing, that's the way I see it. Uh, to me, this, this is a beautiful release. I think it just makes da older Daniel Roth watches even more Which is good for us. Yeah, it's good for Next. us. Next. All right, so again, nice release. I really liked it, but I would have loved to see something new. 
now we talk about uh, probably the most memeable watch of 2023 is the new release of uh, by Jean-Claude Beaver is this <laughs> Turbion Minute Repeater. I mean, the amount of memes I've seen come out on Instagram because number of the one meme watch of all of watches and wonders. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me start with the fact that how many did he make? I, I don't know, but it's it was only a handful. It was a, it was a handful of watches price. that he made. The price on them was 550,000 Swiss francs. Yeah. Uh, shout out to NYC watch guy on Instagram. King Flum and among other couple guys that I follow that collect a lot of independence and so on. They're good watch collectors, but they're also pretty funny. NYC watch guy came up with a currency. Yeah. We now have a currency of 1B. And uh, he was talking about the FB Journes, uh, you know, uh, the finger watch release, yeah. right? This watch. <laughs> and uh, he uh, equated it, because that was super expensive, because I think that one was uh, 980,000 Swiss francs. Yeah. So he said he equated, every, he took every single watch that was released in Watches and Wonders, especially the overpriced stuff, yeah. and he equated it to how many Bs is this, right? Yeah. So the FB Journes was two Bs. Uh, yeah, this one watch, B being this, one beaver. Uh, uh, one yeah. beaver, right? And so like he came out with a crazy, yeah, I kind of went semi-viral over the last couple of weeks, which is pretty funny. Now look, who made the watch? Who made the movement? How good is that minute repeater? How good is that tourbillon? Yeah, so I, I've heard that. So if I'm not mistaken, the, the watchmaker who worked behind it is Luca Soprano, who uh, relaunched Derek, some Derek Pratt watches. He also was the one who kind of rose to prominence because he made the Jacob & Co. Astronomia, actually. Uh, so, so he's a phenomenal watchmaker. The watches finish marvelously. Like It's a, it's a beautiful looking watch. Just take, away, look take away the name. Yeah. It's not a beaver. It's a yeah. minute repeated turbion. That dial is absolutely insane. Yeah. The finishing on the movements is insane. The brace that is executed really exceptionally nice. So is the case. Everything about, take away the beaver, everything the watch, uh, uh, yeah. uh, about that watch is absolutely in, it's insane. Yeah. It's a beautiful 300,000 MSRP watch. Take, you know I mean? take, take a, the name beaver away yeah. and put on, I don't know, Gronfeld. Yeah. Put on, uh, I don't know, give me another independent. Uh, uh, Grubo Force. Grubo yeah, Force. Yeah, whoever. Right? Yeah. All of a sudden, that watch doesn't become so bad. The problem is, the man decides to put his name on the watch, yeah. calling it his own, and all of a sudden, you have all this controversy. As a watch, pound for pound, that is a great watch. It's, it's a great watch, but I think the reason people memed it was because, one, it's, it's grossly overpriced for what it is, in my personal opinion. Right, that's, that's an opinion. Hold on a second. And I think a most minute repeater turbion. I mean, how many times have we seen this before? You know what I mean? There's nothing like crazy innovative. I understand. About this give watch. me, give me ten major brands that are going to be a minute repeat of Turbion. You're going that's to be fair. hovering around a half a million dollar mark. Yeah, that, that's fair. No, that's fair. I mean, listen, the price, the price is in line with the. And market. it's not like some, you but, know, but, some some Turbion they took off the shelf and some minute repeat took off. The shelf. They actually made a minute repeat of Turbion. Who so made, who made that dial? That dial is. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty pretty nice dial. Now I will say this: the only the only thing about this watch. I think that people essentially hated on is the fact that it felt like Jean-Claude Beaver was cashing in on his name. And, and at 550000 I understand why. People are essentially saying you're starting up your own brand and the first watch you release is this insane 550000 Swiss francs at MSRP with no discount kind of watch. It, it, it just felt... It, it's just too much. You know what I mean? You're asking... But there were plenty of brands out that they came out of the gate uh, expensive, right? Uh, they only came out with expensive models. Uh, I mean, a lot yeah. of them failed. But there are plenty of brands out that they came out of the gate making nothing but uber expensive models, two or three different models that are super expensive. Again, Beaver's cash grab on this uh, is going to be made fun of, and it's going to be made fun of for a long time. But if I had to put my money on it, they're all sold out. Uh, I don't think they are. Okay, I, let, I think they are. Let, let's close. You know out. why? Because all the dealers that were carrying other brands yeah. and, from the group, I guarantee you. But Beaver doesn't work for, I think he only works for, um, I think LVMH actually. He was doing like Tag Heuer for a right, while right. and Hublot and all those those brands. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, I personally- I think I they're all sold out. I don't love the watch. I don't love the watch. I don't think it's gonna sell very well. We'll probably buy them for 25, 10 cents. But we'll never buy one. I never said we're gonna buy one. <laughs> 10 cents on the dollar. <laughs> no, uh, let's, mo let's move on to one of my also favorite releases or re-releases, I should say, or tribute watches from Erwerk. This is the UR, what, is, what do they call it this the time? The UR 102, I think. Reloaded. 102, yeah. which, which is basically a reissue, a modern take on things, and affordable. A watch yeah. that comes in at a retail price just under $30,000. Erwerks are expensive, yeah. you know, in terms of retail. I actually requested one of those. There's a wait line for quite a few people mm -hmm. uh, that want one. They're all sold out officially. And for me, 
like the PVD, but still prefer the titanium brush finished uh, with the blue retrograde so, uh, you know, window, I should call it. I think it was a wonderful thing that Eric has done simply because they sort of stepped back, got away from the cubes, as I call them, right? Yeah. Or the wandering hours. And they went back to their roots to where they didn't have the cues, where they did right. something that was completely different. In fact, I still, I'm still, there's a few watches that were out there, like the ones that got away, like the Vianney yeah. Holter Antigua and things like that, stupid cheap. If you remember some of their first prototype, yeah, the all, they had, case. all they had the round case and, the, and, and, just, and just one little window. Oh my. Somebody offered me that watch for 13000 and I turned it down. I wish I had that watch oh, back, right? Bro, that's a bad one. I know, yeah, I know. That's a bad I, one. I know, but look, at the end of the day, we buy and we sell watches. Yeah. We don't collect them, we sell them, right? Yeah. So, uh, but this release is something that, there's very, very few watches that come out at Watches and Wonder or Basel show back in the day that would tell me, oh, I want that and I'm willing to pay list. I'm not gonna wait for this to come out on the secondary to buy it cheaper. Yeah. This is one of those watches. Yeah, I, I actually completely agree. I agree that I prefer the brush titanium look. I like the fact that Erwer kind of went back to their roots for the 25th anniversary of the brand. I think this is, listen, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know the, the MSRP was 30,000 or yeah. whatever it may 28 be. Swiss francs. I, I think that this is a very, very reasonable release. I, I, I'll be honest, I look at this. He's being honest again. It, it's, again it's, you get this? He's being super honest again. It's, it's a nice watch. I'm not blown away by it, um, but it's a nice release. And it's a but nice that's the thing, watch. is that this watch wasn't meant to yeah. blow it's you an anniversary, away. Yeah, it's, a, it's a nice anniversary piece. It's a re-edition. <laughs> re, it's a nice anniversary piece. Yeah. And again, it wasn't meant to blow you away. It was just meant for somebody to actually really like it. And it's so cool that you know, a watch that seemingly back when they first started, nobody was paying attention to. Everybody wanted that cube system, the, the same thing they saw on the Opus 5. Yeah. And people that have been paid, and now all of a sudden it gets reintroduced 25 years later and almost people love it. and it's people cool. love it that goes to say something about design becoming somewhat timeless right and that's really the goal because there's some watches out there that were made 25 years ago that no watch collector would be caught dead putting on their wrist because it's just so outdated like an old pair of shoes but this to me knocked it out of the park love that watch yeah absolutely what else, you, what else you get? That's it. Watch okay, so 2023. I would just like to note that, uh, again, this was the best and the worst of the rest, right? Yeah. Not exactly the best of the rest. We just wanted to highlight other things outside of Rolex, outside of Paddock. As you all have heard on a multiple occasion, Marco was very honest throughout this entire video, <laughs> to be honest with you. But we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, again, as always, like, comment, share, subscribe. If you got any questions for Marco personally, hit him on his DM, on his Instagram. He's always happy to talk watches, especially if you guys are gonna talk about finishes and horological feats and things of that nature. He absolutely loves that stuff. So do I. But in either case, like, comment, share, subscribe, and we'll see you guys on the next one.